Good afternoon. Um, welcome to this uh, webcast. I'm Owen DeLong. I'm here with Cricket Lou, and uh, we're going to talk to you guys a little bit about uh, IPv6. So without further uh, delay, um, one of the reasons this is important is that uh, if you take a look at this graph, this shows you what the IPv4 free pool looked like in the global free pool in the IANA last year at about this time. We thought there was uh, almost two years or a little more than a year and a half at least remaining in that free pool. On the other hand, in February, it looked like this. So um, quite a bit less than a year and uh, way, way less than we thought. Uh, we thought AP NIC would probably run out somewhere around June to October this year. And of course, uh, AP NIC ran out last week. So this is Jeff Houston's projections based entirely on mathematics, and it doesn't allow for uh, two factors, which are the acceleration of demand in the face of scarcity, uh, i.e. the run on the bank scenario. Uh, it also doesn't allow for the idea of what I call the portability of demand, which is now that AP NIC is out, uh, a certain portion of the providers and users in the AP NIC region will want to make their requests with other RIRs where possible, and so they'll come to Aaron and to Ripe, et cetera. Um, so what you can see on this graph is Jeff's rather optimistic uh, projection. On the other hand, uh, I have a slightly more pessimistic view uh, based on my estimation of the portability of demand and other factors. So I think you'll see Ripe be the next registry to run out, and I think that they'll probably run out around June of this year. I won't dwell on the other numbers. You can see them in the slide. Uh, an overview of uh, address policy and where addresses come from for people that may be on the call and kind of unfamiliar with this. Uh, the central registry is known as the Internet Assigned Numbers Authority. They're based in Southern California. That contract is currently being operated by a company called the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, or ICANN. Uh, the IANA distributes IP addresses to five regional internet registries that are continental in scope. Those are uh, RIPE, ARIN, APNIC, AFRINIC, and LACNIC. You can see their geographical boundaries on the map in the background. Um, some of those regional internet registries have subordinate national internet registries, um, and then there are also local internet registries, which are basically ISPs in most cases. Um, the uh, regional internet registries each set their own set of policies. The IANA is governed by global policies. Uh, the global policies are essentially policies that go through each regional internet registry, and the identical policy is adopted by all five and then pushed forward in the, on the global basis. So we've got a lot to cover in the slide deck and not a lot of time to do it compared to the amount of material. So this is going to go by fairly quickly. Normally, I teach a half-day course called An Introduction to IPv6, which is a little bit smaller in scope than what they put in this webinar. So feel free to contact uh, Cricket or myself after the webinar for additional training and information. Uh, the slides should be available online so that you can refer back to them. Uh, some slides included in the presentation are actually more for later reference uh, than for the actual presentation. So don't worry about the fact that we're going to probably skip a few of them. This is actually a, a, a show of how IP addresses kind of get carved up. You start out with the entire global address pool. And of that, uh, the IETF has set aside a uh, one-eighth of that for global unicast addresses, uh, 2000 colon colon slash 3. If we blow that up uh, to take a look at the, um, the size of a slash 12 within that, slash 3, you'll notice that that little tiny sliver would represent a slash 12 if the entire slash 3 were all four of those bars. These are drawn roughly to scale. Uh, if we blow that slash 12 up into eight bars, then each pixel represents 204 ISP slash 32 allocations. Um, and then when we blow a single slash 32 up, we get four bars where each pixel is 409.6 uh, end site slash 48 assignments. 
Further dividing that up, we get another four bars out of each 48, which each pixel represents 409.6 uh, subnet slash 64s. So there's a lot of addresses available. It's much more than IPv4. Uh, this kind of shows you a, a, a graphical comparison. If you think of IP addresses as being measured like weight, uh, the equivalent weight of IPv4 would be approximately seven liters of water. Uh, comparing that to IPv6, IPv6 would weigh as much as planet Earth, the entire planet. All the, all the oceans, all the land mass, all the people, everything. I heard um, something from ICANN that compared the, uh, compared the entire volume of the Earth. That was the equivalent of uh, all IPv6 address space. And, and relative to that, all IPv4 address space was uh, a volume roughly equal to one iPod. I think, although they didn't specify what kind of iPod. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think that's probably about right. Um, putting it in a slightly tastier perspective, um, if we think of an IPv4 slash 24, which will hold 254 hosts, as being roughly a large bag of almond M&Ms, um, which, believe it or not, that is approximately the right count of M&Ms. I verified it. Um, all of IPv4, if you put 1 slash 24 per M&M, would cover 70 yards of a football field in a layer of M&Ms one layer deep, one M&M deep, over only 70 yards of a football field. On the other hand, each slash 64 subnet in IPv6 holds enough hosts that each, uh, that each host being an M&M would literally fill the entirety of the Great Lakes. And there are enough networks that if you make each network a single M&M, there are enough networks to entirely fill the Great Lakes. So you literally have the Great Lakes full of M&Ms squared worth of addresses. OK, so let's talk about why we need to move to IPv6. I get the uh, a lot of versions of this question, but it usually boils down to, look, IPv4 works. It's not broke. Why fix it? Uh, what a lot of people don't understand is, that IPv4 has actually been broken for years. We've just gotten really used to working around that fact. Um, NAT itself is a workaround for not having enough addresses. And then there are various additional workarounds that we've applied on top of that to get around the problems caused by NAT. Um, another problem is that we have this huge routing table. I think it's up to 370,000. Uh, unique prefixes in the routing table on a, on a global basis the last time I looked. And that is primarily the result of a lot of trade-offs that we've had to make to deal with conservation of addresses. And there are very poor implementations of IPsec and address mobility in IPv4 as well. So that has created some additional problems. The um, so, so those things don't really seem like enough for, for like a huge change. Uh, and going from IPv4 to IPv6 only certainly would be a huge change. But it actually turns out to be relatively simple to go from IPv4 as we have it today to IPv4, IPv6 dual stack. It's not a completely minor change, but it's not as bad as a lot of people seem to think. And frankly, we're going to run out of IPv4 addresses really, really soon. And the internet is not going to stop growing. Uh, and NAT only scales so far. So we, we really do have to do something different uh, to, get, to, to keep moving forward. So the question really comes down to which major changes do you want? Uh, one choice is IPv6 dual stack, which gives you continued connectivity to everything. You might need to use some transition technologies such as dual stack Lite, 6RD, NAT64 with DNS64. Um, and if you do one of those things or, or multiples of those things, uh, and you get onto dual stack with, with IPv6 capabilities on your network, then you get to join this lady at the pool. On the other hand, uh, if you, if you don't want to do that, you know, you can try and depend on large scale NAT, NAT444, um, IPv4 business as usual as long as it continues to work, um, and join this guy out in the Australian outback that thinks IPv4 isn't exhausted, it's just really tired. Or you can count on what I call the Mayan calendar solution. The Mayan calendar solution is the belief that the world's going to end in 2012 anyway, in which case we probably can get by with v4 until that time. So in terms of cost benefit analysis, because that's what a lot of business people like to look at, uh, you basically have two alternatives to consider. 
IPv6 versus large-scale NAT, or carrier-grade NAT as some people have called it, or IPv6 now versus IPv6 later. Uh, when you're looking at large-scale NAT, the things you have to consider are what is the opportunity cost of the incredibly poor user experience that is virtually guaranteed in that environment? Um, what is the cost of the complexity in, in large-scale NAT? It's very complex to set up, it's more complex to maintain, and it's even harder to troubleshoot than anything you've seen today with NAT. And what does that cost? And then there are questions about whether it will even scale. Um, you know, the, the, one of the big questions on scaling that has to do with the Communications Assistance for Law Enforcement Act, where providers are going to have to keep vast, vast, vast amounts of log data just to be able to, uh, to satisfy legal requirements with these large-scale NAT devices in place. IPv6, on the other hand, unless your hardware is very old, more than five years old roughly, uh, you probably don't need too many upgrades on the hardware to su support IPv6. It can be relatively simple to deploy by overlaying your existing IPv4 technology and topology. Uh, it does temporarily require some duplicate maintenance efforts for peering sessions, access control lists, prefix filters, etc. But compared to the likely costs and complexity of large-scale NAT, it really does look cheap in most every case. In terms of IPv6 now versus later, there are some real savings to be had in the long run with IPv6. And beginning your implementation on now may allow you a slower, steady progression towards full integration in a more controlled manner. You can plan your spending. You can research products. You can take time to seek the best pricing. Uh, you have the opportunity to implement IPv6 uh, in, in a controlled fashion. On the other hand, if you go later, uh, you may end up in a significantly accelerated deployment scenario. You may have people breathing down your neck saying, we need IPv6 deployed and we need it yesterday. This means emergency spending, no time to negotiate costs with your vendors, uh, more shipping costs, everything. Especially with the price of fuel going up, FedEx is not getting less expensive. Getting your staff exposure to IPv6 while it's not mission critical also pays off. You get... Uh, reduce training costs, and you uh, can reduce the service affecting outages as a result. So the big question becomes, what's the ultimate business case for IPv6? There's no killer application. There's no return on investment case in terms of, you know, you, you deploy IPv6 and money will rain from heaven. Um, you really need to deploy IPv6 basically for the same reasons that you buy insurance, the same reasons that you invested in Y2K compliance, and the same reasons you have a disaster recovery plan for your business. You do have one, right? Um, if you don't have IPv6 when IPv4 runs out, you will be at an ever-increasing disadvantage compared to your competitors that do. So how to move forward. Start with a test lab for each phase. Deploy IPv6 at one of your peering edges. And then, you know, gradually expand that to the rest of your backbone and your other edges as you connect them. Concentrate on your public-facing content and interfaces first, your web servers, your email uh, functions, etc. Begin some in-house customer trials, especially start dogfooding this in your support departments so that they can get experience seeing what your customers and your end users are going to be dealing with. Uh, considering adding IPv6 capabilities to your enterprise where it makes sense. Look at the low-hanging fruit first. In terms of a test lab, it doesn't have to be super fancy. You don't have to simulate the entire internet. You can usually get by with a small number of routers and end systems. Test your configuration elements and become familiar with the configurations and gotchas of whatever vendors apply to your network. Try out microcosms of various deployment scenarios and then go through some break-fix practice with them in the lab before you get them into the real world. Planning your IPv6 address space is a little different from IPv4. In IPv4, the driving force in planning was address scarcity with aggregation as a somewhat secondary concern. In IPv6, we don't have scarcity. Try to plan out your address space from the bottom up so that you can get what you need in the first request and be able to maximize aggregation without regard to utilization density. In IPv4, we scaled things based on hosts, and we counted how many hosts we could fit into each subnet. In IPv6, we actually don't count hosts anymore. 
If you've got a need for a subnet, you make it a 64 and move on. You can put as many hosts as you need to into a 64. Each slash 64 will hold 18 quintillion plus hosts. Your switch won't handle that. When you're planning out your IPv4, when you're planning out your IPv6 network, try to avoid these common IPv4 think mistakes. Don't get overly conservative. Don't try to assign a slash 96 or a slash 112 or a slash 126 just because you don't think that network will need more hosts than that. Just give every subnet a slash 64, even if it's a point-to-point -point link, and move on. There are a lot of advantages to this, not the least of which is it makes your engineering a lot simpler. Disaggregation for density optimization is another common mistake. Just give the same size chunk to each site, usually a slash 48 if you're dealing with N sites, but if you're dealing with a POP that, uh, at an ISP that's going to host customers, maybe you need a 36 or a 40 uh, to handle the number of customers you have in those POPs. A few sites may require multiple chunks, that's okay, and in general it's worthwhile to round up. In terms of routing options, native IPv6 is clearly the best choice when it's available. However, that may be an uphill battle with your upstream providers. Make sure you're already pushing your upstream providers about this so that you get it uh, before you need it. Tunneled solutions are a good second choice. There are many free tunnel ro brokers, such as tunnelbroker.net, operated by Hurricane Electric. They're good for situations where you can't get native, but they're not ideal in terms of performance. In order of preference, you're generally going to prefer a 6-in-4 tunnel over a 6 4 tunnel, and Teredo is generally a last resort, even for a tunneled solution. So, 6-in-4 tunnels have the advantage that they're manually configured. They're between two specific defined endpoints with known IPv4 addresses, and they mostly operate just like GRE. In fact, you can use GRE instead of 6-in-4 and use it to tunnel IPv4 and IPv6 over the same tunnel. Um, the advantage to this is you generally have minimal extra topology and it's very deterministic and easy to troubleshoot. There aren't as many moving pieces. Uh, in terms of a 6 4 tunnel, the server side is found through any cast and it's automatic with no manual configuration required. Any cast theoretically minimizes the extra topology, but it doesn't always work out that way. As more 6 to 4 servers are deployed topologically closer, it automatically migrates the tunnel to the closer server. There's no provision for over or underloaded server load balancing, however, so that can sometimes be a problem. Teredo is the the one advantage Teredo has is that it will get through most firewalls and NAT devices whether you want it to or not. It's enabled by default on many Windows products and it can be a huge security problem for IPv6 unaware enterprises. It's kind of a weird three-party NAT traversal tunneling solution with a lot of moving parts. It works automatically most of the time. It has about a 30% failure rate and when it fails it's ridiculously difficult to troubleshoot. Okay, so now I'm going to hand it over to Cricket for a little while so he can talk about addressing DHCP, DNS, and uh, IP address management and a little bit more. Here's Cricket. Thanks a lot, Owen. I appreciate it. So um, I've just got a little bit of material here, it's not too much, uh, that talks about how Higher level services, the ones that I'm used to working with, like DNS and DHCP, work with IPv6. So I have to say, first of all, that I'm still learning about this. Um, so I'll, I'll rely on Owen to give me some uh, some coaching on this. But I found out some pretty interesting things. First of all, in IPv6 networks, clients have a number of different means for getting uh, IPv6 addresses. One of them is, of course, is the, the tried and true way, which is that uh, somebody actually hand configures those uh, IP addresses using the operating system. That doesn't change. That's still certainly an option, although it's a, a relatively cumbersome one. We also have DHCP v6, which is sort of IPv6's counterpart to, to DHCP, where the client, of course, sends a request to a DHCP server. That's, that's not uh, broadcast anymore. That's a multicast. 
uh, and the DHCP server will assign an IPv6 address from some pool, of course, it could be a, a significantly larger pool than it was way back in the days of IPv4. And then we have this new animal called Stateless Address Auto Configuration, or SLAC for short. And uh, SLAC is, is almost like a plug and play networking concept. Basically, it allows uh, an IPv6 smart client to be connected to a network to discover the network that it's on, that is the prefix for the network and the prefix length for the network, um, through advertisements that are sent by routers on that network, and then sort of synthesizing a usable IPv6 address on that network, taking a, a fairly simple hash of its MAC address, appending that to the prefix, um, doing something called uh, neighbor discovery to make sure it's not using an IP address that's already in use on the network, uh, and, and then coming up that way. It's a pretty, uh, pretty slick system, really. Um, so if you, if you think of this as a matrix, there are actually kind of four different options. Up here in the upper left, we have the manual option, which is complete manual configuration of your IPv6 address and uh, uh, you know, possibly your route, the DNS parameters that you need in order to send queries to a recursive name server. Um, down at the, the bottom left, we have Slack, which is again stateless address auto configuration, uh, which now has the ability to assign those DNS parameters, like our DNSS, that's recursive DNS server, or your DNS search list, which is DNS SL. Uh, those can be assigned via new options in router advertisements as well. So that's basically entirely plug and play, no DHCP necessary whatsoever. Um, your IPv6 stack can come up get configured and know basically everything that it needs to know to function on that network. We also have on the right hand side a couple of mechanisms that make some use of DHCPv6. There's stateful DHCPv6 up in the upper right, which is we rely entirely on DHCPv6. By stateful we mean DHCP is responsible for handing us our IPv6 address as well as handling us things like DNS configuration parameters. Um, and then we have a hybrid solution, which is the one in the, the lower right, which is Slack and stateless DHCPv6. Stateless DHCPv6 is kind of a new animal on, on uh, networks. It basically says, I've already got an IPv6 address that I've derived via Slack, so I don't need DHCP to assign me that address, but I would like to get other options that tell me, for example, where my recursive DNS server is and so on. Uh, so you've got your choice, and in fact, it's not mutually exclusive, something that I found out uh, relatively recently. You can actually use more than one of these. <clears throat> when I had my Mac, <clears throat> excuse me, connected to uh, my network at home, which supports IPv6, courtesy of Hurricane Electric's tunnel broker, um, I realized that it actually was getting a number of different IPv6 addresses. It was getting one via Slack, and it was getting one via DHCPv6. So it had uh, multiple IP addresses in addition to the link local address. Now, the DHCP options that are used with DHCP v6 are actually different options. They're separate options from the old, say, name servers option, the old domain search option. <clears throat> and they have to be because they actually support, for example, IPv6 addresses uh, to enumerate the recursive name servers that you want to query. So I provided here just a couple of uh, examples of these. These are things that you would plug into, for example, an ISC DHCP server uh, running version 4.2 or later or the Microsoft DHCP server uh, in Windows Server 2008. Of course, if you were using Windows Server 2008, you'd do it via uh, the DHCP console, not via uh, a strict textual syntax like the one you see at the bottom here. Now, DNS has been ready to handle forward mapping to IPv6 addresses for some time. I mean, the RFC that actually originally added this is RFC 1886, believe it or not. So it's been around forever. Uh, and forward mapping uses a new record type, relatively new, I guess, called a quad A record. And uh, here are a couple of examples of quad A records. These are, are, are named for my dogs, Charlie and Jesse. So you can see uh, as, an, as the R data, they uh, accept the standard format for textual representation of an IPv6 address, which is a series of as many, uh, as, many as eight different quartets of hex digits. Uh, so these ones use the, uh, the IPv6 network that's reserved for documentation, which starts 2001, colon, DB8, colon, colon, and then the rest of the address. 
So you can use abbreviations here, which is very handy, right? You can emit leading zeros in a quartet of hex digits. Uh, you can use the colon colon abbreviation, which you see towards the end of these IP addresses to make this as compact as, uh, as possible. Still, of course, uh, considerably more typing involved than, than IPv4. Uh, quad A records can be added to any old zone data file. You don't have to have a new zone in order to accommodate IPv6. You can add these side by side with A records that might be attached to the same domain names. However, there is a, a caveat that we should mention there, which is that you may not want to attach quad A records to domain names that already own A records, especially if they correspond to fairly popular servers. There are some stub resolvers out there, those are the DNS uh, clients, that were, will uh, preferentially look up quad A records when both quad A and A records exist, even though the operating systems that are calling the stub resolver don't necessarily have global IPv6 connectivity. And then what typically happens is that you have these long timeouts where the client stack tries to communicate with some IPv6 address that it can't actually reach. So you can have timeouts uh, just on individual queries that can be you know, 20 seconds to three minutes long. And then, of course, uh, you know, if you're sending quite a number of queries because you're trying to resolve all the links on a web page, that can be, uh, that can really add up to a, a huge delay, right? Yeah, it can, Cricket. And actually, one of the uh, things to consider when you're thinking about this, however, is that this brokenness has been measured to apply to roughly 0.05% of the Internet. So unless you're concerned about getting every last customer uh, a, an absolute uh, good IPv4 experience uh, and not worried about what you lose with not providing an IPv6 experience, I think this is becoming less and less of an issue every day. And IPv6 World Day, actually, I think will do a lot to, to make some progress on this issue. That's a really good point. And I think, actually, one of the, the sort of uh, raisons d'etre of, of World IPv6 Day is so that big web properties like uh, Google and Yahoo and, and people like that can actually try adding both their uh, quad A record and their A record to their, their primary domain names. So they're effectively going to induce this problem. Um, but as you said, it's a very small population of, of resolvers that exhibit this. The, the paper that I saw, uh, which was co-written by a couple of guys at Yahoo, Igor Gashinsky and uh, Jason Fessler, um, it estimated that I think they were, it was between, as you said, 0.05%, 0 0.078% of the population of resolvers on the Internet, which you know, for, for a property the size of, say, Google or Yahoo is still hundreds of thousands of clients. For Infoblox, sadly, not nearly <laughs> as many. <laughs> um, exactly. Yep. Yeah. So you do want to be prudent about that. Um, ISC actually has implemented a, a new feature in order to kind of work around this. Uh, this appeared in, in Bind 9.7. And uh, it actually gives your name server the ability to effectively lie, to say, hey, I got a query for a quad A record from a stub resolver, but I received that query over IPv4, not over IPv6. So I don't have any concrete evidence uh, to make me believe that that resolver actually has global IPv6 connectivity. So with this new statement, which you, uh, you see an example of there uh, at the bottom of the slide, filter quad A on v6, you can say if you receive these queries for quad A records over v4, uh, you can pretend that even though there is a quad A record for a domain name, that it doesn't exist, and instead do an A record lookup uh, you know, based on the, the client's successive query. Uh, it's a little bit contentious, and and I think some would argue a little bit uh, a little bit dangerous. But it's provided there for you, just in case you happen to have a large population of uh, of these resolvers. Just waiting for the slide to advance now. Here we go. So reverse mapping, reverse mapping in uh, IPv6 actually requires the same reverse mapping resource record type, which is the pointer record, as we used in IPv4. But what we do here is we use a different reverse mapping domain, which is called IP6.ARPA. And the labels below IP6.ARPA, instead of corresponding to the octets in an IPv4 uh, 
uh, address correspond to the nibbles, that is the hex digits, in an IPv6 address. And of course, just like with IPv4, we have to, we have to produce these in reverse order, that is the, uh, the most significant uh, nibble, the most significant hex digit is the one that's closest to IPv ip6.arpa, uh, and the other one is way, way out there at the far left-hand side. So uh, your owner names for reverse mapping of IPv6 addresses, uh, if they're written, com written out completely, they have 34 labels, uh, 32 labels corresponding to the 32 uh, respective hex digits in an IPv6 address and then ip6.arpa on the end, and then we have the pointer record and then the domain name that that IPv6 address reverse, reverse maps to. So unfortunately, no abbreviation is, is possible here because it would introduce ambiguity. You wouldn't know which IP address it was that you were actually trying to reverse map. On the other, on the other hand, you do actually have the option of abbreviating uh, most of your records by using the dollar origin construct. Uh, so you can actually, uh, for example, say dollar origin and then specify um, the, the, the last 126 bits or whatever of the address, or the first 126 bits of the address in reverse, I should say, uh, and then only have to specify the remaining um, or 112 bits of the address or whatever it is, uh, you know, in, the, in each record. So that can be actually a very useful construct. Yeah, that's a very good point. So if you are in the position of having to actually edit zone data files that contain IPv6 reverse mapping by hand, and, and we certainly hope that you're not. We hope that you've got some system to, to synthesize those automatically, or you've got an IP address management system that will handle that for you, or uh, your clients are using dynamic update to register that, that information for themselves. But if, if you uh, are in that position, then definitely do make uh, liberal use of the uh, dollar origin control statement to change the origin in the uh, zone data file and save yourself some typing and uh, you know, save yourself from wearing out your, uh, your period key. So uh, you know, a number of people in the, the chat pod have asked why customers would migrate to IPv6 in the, in the first place. And uh, I, you know, I think Owen and I have similar opinions on this, but maybe slightly different. Um, you know, one of the things that we've seen at Infoblox is that uh, ISPs and wireless carriers now just can't get additional IPv4 address space, particularly, particularly in Asia Pacific where they're only doling out IPv4 address space in, in uh, slash 22s, right, which is like 1,024 IP addresses maximum. Not enough to make any kind of difference to your ISP business, right? Well, and, and more importantly, that's, uh, that's one slash 22 per provider <laughs> period ever. Right, right, yeah, that is a, a, a real paucity of IPv4 address space. So those ISPs and wireless carriers will obviously have to expand using new IPv4 address space or they're going to have to hack something up using some form of IPv4 NAT, and we certainly hope they don't do that. So as they expand, and we've heard this from some of our customers at Infoblox, as they expand, they're going to start using uh, IPv, IPv6 address space and uh, to provide connectivity to IPv4 resources like IPv4 servers out there on the internet. They're going to use transition technologies like uh, you know, NAT64 and DNS64. Uh, in, in the case of most of our customers, we, we think that those enterprises are probably going to continue using RFC 1918 IPv4 address space for some time, but they're going to start uh, providing services to clients on IPv6 because, of course, you know, any external facing services that they run will need to support IPv6 um, for IPv6 only clients. And that leads us to a deployment plan for, for most of our uh, customers that looks something like this, uh, a phased deployment plan that has them start, and I think that uh, Owen, your suggestion started more or less uh, the same way, with external internet-facing servers such as web servers, name servers, mail servers, and things like that, making sure that those have IPv6 connectivity, support services over IPv6, so all these, these uh, new carriers, new ISPs, mobile carriers, and so on, deploying over v6 have native uh, uh, connectivity to your, your external resources. That's exactly right. So from there, of course, we go to internal test beds and, and you know, trying to make sure that uh, all of your gear actually has v6 support. And of course, very importantly, something that you mentioned earlier, uh, you know, beginning to, to build staff experience with v6 uh, so they, they, they understand what's required. You know, what, what do I need to do to administer v6 on this this make of router, uh, you know, on this make of firewall, what kind of support does it have for v6? 
Um, and then you can begin to, to broaden your rollout to do a rollout so that your internal routing infrastructure supports IPv6 and can route IPv6 capably. And only then, uh, once there's a business case for it, once it makes sense, you can start rolling out v6 on internal servers using uh, dual stacks and eventually on internal clients using dual stacks as well. So now I'll throw it back to Owen, who will talk about uh, what's ready, what kind of equipment out there actually has support for uh, IPv6 today and how much support, how to get started with uh, IPv6, managing that transition to IPv6 and uh, the myth versus reality of IPv6. Okay, thank you, Cricket, for uh, that information. So, um, talking about what's ready, most of the routers, Backbone, Core, and Enterprise, and even the workgroup routers are ready. Uh, most hosts, Linux, BSD, Mac OS, even uh, Windows platforms uh, are ready. Uh, higher end switches, especially most of the layer three capable switches these days are, uh, are V6 ready. A lot of ISPs such as Hurricane Electric are, uh, are there or getting there very soon. And even some of the content providers such as Netflix, Google, YouTube, Facebook, et cetera. In terms of what's not ready, customer premise equipment is one of the biggest things. Uh, very few of the consumer grade residential gateways are ready. There's a few products from D-Link and Netgear that are uh, coming along nicely. Um, DHCP prefix delegation is uh, unimplemented, untested, or poorly implemented in most of these situations, and it needs to, to really get uh, better. Um, Consumer electronics are probably one of the biggest remaining gaps. Uh, TiVos, uh, televisions, all of these different things, amplifiers that uh, have IP connectivity but don't have IPv6 capabilities. Uh, in terms of last mile technologies, this is another gap. A lot of DSLAMs are not IPv6 capable. A lot of the passive optical network concentrators are not yet v6 capable and there are a lot of other consumer aggregator technologies uh, such as brasses that are not ready infrastructure management systems a lot of in-house software needs to be improved to to support v6 and a lot of vendor provided software as well um, you know some of the appliance vendors uh, such as infoblox are, are, are still advancing their uh, their ipv6 readiness in their products um, Getting ready and keeping track, uh, there's a lot of information available at tunnelbroker.net in terms of training, tunnels, statistics, forums. Aaron maintains an IPv6 wiki at www.getipv6.info that contains a lot of status information about most of the IPv6 ready products and services and even some information about the ones that are not IPv6 ready. It's user updatable, it's a wiki. So if you learn something that's different from what's there, update the wiki. Uh, there's lots of IPv6 advice and help available there. In terms of getting connected, start by demanding IPv6 from your upstreams. Make this a checklist item for your contract renewals. If they tell you nobody else is asking for it, escalate it. I've seen ISPs literally say this to multiple people in a row. You're the only one asking for this. And it's, you know, they, they, they can't tell 10 people that and still be telling the truth. If, you're, if they're not ready, push for a commit date when they will be ready and start considering what alternatives you might have if they don't get there. Implement via a tunnel to at least get your infrastructure up and running and tested. If you're at an exchange point, leverage that. Look for peers with an open peering policy. Uh, Hurricane Electric will actually offer free IPv6 transit as well as open peering for IPv4 and IPv6 at any exchange point where we are. In terms of managing your vendors, any vendor that's not IPv6 ready, it's time to start pushing on them. When possible, avoid purchasing any new equipment that is not ready for IPv6. Make it a checklist item for your product qualifications. And I don't mean just look if the vendor has IPv6 on their spec sheet. I mean actually research whether it has the support for IPv6 that you're going to need in your environment. Test the IPv6 capabilities the vendor is promising. Don't just trust their checklist on the spec sheet. As you encounter bugs, report them. Your vendors cannot fix what they do not know is broken. And if it's broken for you, it's probably broken for others too. Use tools like the wiki to compare notes about vendors and share information about vendor accomplishments and shortcomings. 
don't hesitate to make me too phone calls to your vendors to raise the visibility of IPv6 as a priority on their radar. Push on sales, push on marketing, and push on support. All of these people have input into the process. There's minimal operational experience out there so far. This means vendors are still trying to figure out what the IPv6 implementation priorities should be on their product roadmaps. You can have a lot of influence on that if you jump on it now. Oops. OK, in terms of managing your management, um, I've put together a website that helps a little bit explaining IPv6 to your chief information officer or chief technology officer. Um, there is a, there's a criticality to starting the dialogue now, if you haven't already. Let them know what IPv6 is and how it's going to affect your organization. Be honest. Explain why waiting until customers demand it is a recipe for failure. Be equally honest about the fact that it's like insurance or disaster recovery. One of those things with no immediate tangible ROI, but you're going to have to do it anyway. In terms of training resources, there's free online training at tunnelbroker.net. Uh, Safari.oreilly.com has some excellent resources, uh, some excellent books on IPv6 available there on the bookshelf. Um, the Business V6 site that I alluded to earlier uh, can help you in terms of the business uh, case. There are books from Juniper, Cisco Press, and O'Reilly on the subject, all of which contain some excellent information. In terms of implementation considerations, staff training is going to be a big thing. Plan for needing a fair amount of that. Plan for prototyping and development of V6 as it's going to apply to your environment. Staff training, so important I list it twice. Backbone deployment, support department deployment, Customer trials, customer deployment. Start in an edge and expand inward, avoiding islands where possible. In terms of software updates, you're going to need to look at almost everything in your organization. You're going to need to look at your provisioning systems, your IP allocation systems. Uh, if you're doing SWIPs or Arhuis management, you're going to need to look at those systems. Logging and reporting systems may need to get updated. Monitoring and alerting systems, other in-house software. Database schemas, parsers. Uh, I just lost the slides. I apologize, everybody. Um, database schemas and parsers are going to need to get updated. OK, we're waiting for the slide to advance here. Okay, so um, I got asked to address some common IPv6 myths as part of this. Uh, one of the most common ones I hear is I can't do IPv6 because I still have thing that requires IPv4. You can deploy IPv4 and IPv6 in parallel. Though they won't talk to each other, they coexist nicely on the same boxes. Another case I hear is there's no return on investment, so there's no business case to deploy IPv6. In reality, there are a lot of things you do without a business case. Disaster recovery, business continuity plans, insurance, Y2K compliance are all similar examples to our need to deploy IPv6. So uh, another common myth I get is IPv6 is hard. It really isn't all that hard. If you're already familiar with IPv4, you'll find that 99% of what you need to know about IPv6 is 96 more bits, no magic. It's pretty trivial to learn that remaining 1%, and it's well worth it. IPv6 is not as secure as IPv4 because there's no NAT for security. Uh, completely false. In IPv4, your security comes from stateful inspection. NAT is actually antithetical to security because it destroys and obscures audit trail information. Another common myth is IPv4 was supposed to run out 10 years ago. Why should you believe me now? This one is less common now than a couple of years ago, but I still hear it. IPv4 run out was pushed back by a little more than a decade by NAT. But now, even with NAT, run out is upon us. IANA is already out. 
There's one RIR that's already out, APNIC. The others are going to start running out very soon. Large scale NAT is easier. That is such a myth. Nothing could be further from the truth. Large scale NAT is expensive and difficult to deploy. It's more expensive to maintain, especially with the CALEA requirements in the United States, and it's very common, to, very complex to troubleshoot. In addition, it provides a very poor user experience because it breaks many common and popular services and applications, such as voice over IP, instant messaging, etc. Another myth is IPv6 needs a killer app before people will deploy it. That would be nice, but it's not likely. At this point, the killer app is continuing to expand the internet, which is going to happen one way or the other. Preparing for World IPv6 Day. There are two classes of systems, and they require two distinct approaches. There are servers, which are going to require full dual stack to the extent possible, and then there are clients, which just need basic network connectivity over IPv6. For servers, it, IPv6 day is primarily a safe haven so that large content sites can all turn on quad A records on the same day and not be perceived as the one broken site that broke their site by doing this. It's a chance to observe and identify the problems that come up with native dual stack operations. Hopefully it will work sufficiently well that most sites leave their quad A records on afterwards. In terms of clients, Turn on your IPv6 protocol stack. Get the network ready to forward native IPv6 packets and avoid automatic tunnels if at all possible. Be prepared for some support issues. And you don't have to wait until IPv6 day to do this. In fact, it's best if you do what you can for your clients to get them ready to talk to IPv6 day ahead of time. IPv6 day, by the way, for those that don't know, is going to be June 8th of this year. It's being sponsored by ISOC, and if you do a Google search for World IPv6 Day, you'll find all kinds of information about it. In terms of the priorities, the, the number one priority is to get your public-facing web servers on IPv6 and ready to talk to the IPv6 internet to the greatest extent possible. Be prepared to respond to problems that may crop up. Most of the problems you're going to face on the server side are actually going to be due to broken IPv6 implementations on the client side. Teach your staff to be prepared to help users address these issues. Make sure management understands what's going to happen. What is Hurricane Electric doing for IPv6 Day? The simple answer is we're fully and actively participating by changing absolutely nothing. The more detailed answer is every day is IPv6 Day at Hurricane Electric. Our entire environment is already fully dual stacked. Our web servers have had quad A records on them for years. Our desktops are dual stack. Our professional services division stands ready to help other organizations with their preparations for IPv6 Day. Some resources that are available to you. There's a ref an IPv6 resource center at Infoblox. Um, there's also a very nice IPv6 transition white paper there. And then, of course, you can use the Hurricane Electric Tunnel Broker to help you get connectivity and also get some training on IPv6. And with that, we are going to open it up to some questions. So, Catherine, take it away. Just one uh, unsolicited plug for your Tunnel Broker service. I, I used that to set up v6 connectivity to, to my house. And, you know, everything went swimmingly, and I still have v6 connectivity. Thanks to you guys. There's a lot of great documentation on your website, too. Excellent. Thank you very much, Cricket. So why don't I go ahead and read a couple of these uh, questions. Uh, you know, these, these are, are questions that uh, came in. First one came from Chris. He said, uh, what are some good books for IPv6 fundamentals for a network administrator? Uh, everything I see out there is 2005 to 2007. Now, I know that you had a couple of links. You mentioned publishers, like uh, Juniper Press, I believe, had some stuff. Um, are, are there specific books you'd recommend? I, I don't actually have any particular books that I recommend um, because I haven't read most of them and I hesitate to recommend anything I haven't read. Uh, however, I will say that even though the, a lot of the books out there were from 2005 to 2007, it turns out IPv6 hasn't changed a whole lot in the intervening years. It's mostly been ready for that long and we've just been trying to get people to, uh, to actually uh, adopt it. And so it's time to move forward. Most of the, the stuff in those books will still be accurate. Juniper is coming out with a, uh, a book by Chris Grundeman uh, called IPv6 Day One, and that's an excellent introductory uh, book. It's very, very short. I did an editorial review 
of that book, and, and so I know its content uh, fairly well. Uh, I believe you're actually about to release a book, Cricket, that uh, you had me review part of, and uh, that looks like it's going to be a, a very good uh, set of information on, on DNS and IP address management in V6. Maybe you want to talk a little bit about that. Yeah, thanks for the plug. Um, it, it's really a, just an ebook, so it's a, a fairly short thing, but it, it's specifically sort of uh, DNS and bind on IPv6. So sort of what you need to know in order to run your bind name servers on a, on a v6 network, how to do forward mapping and reverse mapping, and how to deal with NAT64 and other, other nuances like that. So uh, thanks very much. You were by far the, the, the reviewer who contributed the most <laughs> to that. Um, we did also have uh, a few other questions. Um, we had one from uh, Liam Hall who asked uh, what GRE was. I guess uh, when we passed through the, the transition technologies section, he was wondering about GRE. Okay, GRE stands for Generic Route Encapsulation, and it's actually been around for a very, very long time, even before IPv6 was even developed. And it's literally a way to use um, the Internet as a Layer 2 transport mechanism uh, by defining two tunnel endpoints in terms of their IP addresses, either their IPv4 or their IPv6 addresses. And you can carry uh, IP or other protocols that are not IP over uh, those tunnels. So it's just a very, very generic tunnel mechanism. OK, great. Um, why don't I take one or two to, to relieve you of the duty? <laughs> um, uh, there's one here from, I guess it's Kamina, who asks, is the industry ready for this, or will this be another DNSSEC scenario? Uh, that's probably a good question. Um, you know, uh, uh, certainly on the, on the backbone of the Internet, I think that, uh, you know, we're ready. We're already uh, handling v6 routing today, so that, so that doesn't change. I'd, I'd say the most um, significant place where we really have a, a deficit is in, you know, most IT professionals' understanding of IPv6, and that, that I would say most people I talk to uh, really don't understand IPv6 and, and, and how it works, even, even though these are people who uh, work with uh, networks on a day-to-day -day basis. And then, of course, you pointed out uh, a lot of the deficits with respect to individual pieces of, of equipment, you know, certain equipment that, that doesn't do a good job of supporting IPv6, like a lot of customer premises equipment. What do you think? you think that's about right? Well, I actually think that that is very, very on target. Uh, another factor that I think is, is worth considering is that a lot of the knowledge deficit is more perceptual than actual. I think there are a lot of people out there that assume IPv6 is going to be a whole lot harder than it's actually going to be uh, in order to learn it. And I think that if you're working with IPv4 networks on a daily basis, you actually already do know 99 plus percent of what you need to know about working with IPv6 moving forward. Uh, DNSSEC, on the other hand, has a lot more moving pieces and a lot more complexity to it. So I think the industry is also ready for DNSSEC, but it's taking longer to roll out because I think it's a much steeper learning curve than IPv6. Yeah, I mean, certainly DNSSEC is, is theoretically a pretty complex extension to DNS. And I, I know I've been talking about it for years now, and I'm not sure I'm, I hope I'm pushing the ball a little bit forward. Um, there were a few other good questions here. Uh, one of them, boy, Chris, uh, Chris asked a, a lot of questions. He asks, uh, is Slack simplistically analogous to the uh, 169.254.16 IPv4 addresses? Yeah, the, the, there's a few big differences uh, between Slack and Epipa, or the, the 169.254 address. Um, they're both called um, stateless address auto configuration uh, to, to some extent. The difference is that a PIPA addresses are only really usable within a local environment, and even there they have very, very limited capabilities. Slack actually does allow you to get a globally unique global IPv6 address or set of addresses that can be used uh, to communicate anywhere. Uh, Slack is actually pretty neat, and I'm, I'm using it at home quite extensively. Uh, it may or may not be uh, desirable in enterprises where they actually need to track uh, specifically the mapping of hosts to IP addresses. However, it is MAC address based, so you can fairly easily track 
a particular host, if you know its MAC address, uh, through Slack, even across multiple subnets, as that host moves around your organization. Um, here's, here's a good question. Uh, this is also from Liam Hall that I think might be a great sort of jumping off point for listeners, which is, is there a community for this sort of discussion where we can leverage pros and those who have gone before? Um, I know that, for example, um, GoGo Inc. hosts one, but what, 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 are, what are your sort of preferred forums for this kind of uh, discussion? Well, GoGo offers a, a very nice forum. There's also uh, a set of forums actually at tunnelbroker.net that are run by Hurricane Electric. And those forums, unlike a lot of the, uh, the industry forums, not only encourage users to talk to each other, but we actually have knowledgeable staff members with actual IPv6 operational experience that participate regularly in the forums and help to answer questions and, and try to help users advance their understanding and their deployments of IPv6. Mm -hmm. That's great. That's great. Um, Gord Taylor asked, this is, is a good question, I think, where do you think we'll see IPv6 general adoption to occur first, uh, email? And I think, if I had to guess, I would say external facing web servers uh, rather, than, rather than email, although I think that they're sort of almost equivalently easy to, to take care of. What do you think? Well, I, I think it's important to do both uh, relatively quickly. I think that the uh, the first priority kind of depends on uh, your organizational priorities and how you want to approach it. One of the advantages of doing your email server first is that you can do it in a way that's not completely visible to your clients. The, the background store and forward operations of email mean that if you uh, apply IPv6 and it's causing long delays or timeouts or these other issues, for the people connecting to it, you can actually monitor and watch for that, but it doesn't actually do any harm, and it doesn't become necessarily user noticeable or not as, as keenly user noticeable uh, as a web server that doesn't respond for three minutes, because the user is generally not sitting there waiting to watch their message get delivered. Uh, they, they generally send it and forget about it, and if it arrives within a half hour, everybody's usually OK in most situations. Um, so, so that may be a, a good reason to do your email servers first. Certainly, you want to get your web servers up and operational and ready to serve IPv6 requests as soon as possible as well. Um, I guess I'll take one of them, which is from Rodrigo, who asks, shortcuts as double colons don't work for pointer records? And no, in fact, they don't. <laughs> the owner record of a pointer record, or rather the owner name, of a pointer record is is the full you know 34 label uh, domain name and and as Owen suggested you know make liberal use of the origin control statement to be able to abbreviate that as much as possible but you can't use uh, the colon colon abbreviation uh, in the owner name. Yeah, another trick that can be very handy is you can use dig or host to uh, to feed it your reverse query and uh, you know in terms of the shortened address form in its forward form and have it spit back the reverse address it went looking for uh, and then you can copy and paste that. Yeah, that's a that's a neat trick and a suggestion that you made to me when you were doing the tech review for the book, which was you know you can say dig da, uh, dig dash x, which is for reverse mapping, and then the abbreviated form of the domain name. And even if you don't have any records set up, then the nice thing is that dig will parrot the query name that it's sending. You know, it'll all, and in the query, well, there you have that big long 34 label string that you can then copy out and then paste into a, a, a reverse mapping zone data file. Um, let us see, what else do we have in the way of questions from our folks here? I guess we're a little bit over now. Um, uh, Jimena asks, are there any labs from which to test V6? I'm not sure whether she means labs that she can use to uh, test V6 or, or labs that do V6 testing. I know that actually just recently we were talking about the UNH, University of New Hampshire uh, Interoperability Lab, which has done some V6 testing, right? Do, do you know of others? Yeah, I don't really have a, a, a great answer to that question um, other than the UNH Interoperability Lab. I'm sure each router vendor um, that you work with probably has their own uh, 
testing labs. I know many of the router vendors operate customer interoperability testing labs where you can actually uh, have the vendor deploy your particular scenario in their lab and go in there and do whatever testing you, uh, you feel is needed on a scheduled basis. And I recommend talking to your uh, your router vendors and your switch vendors about the ability to to do those things with their lab resources. I, I just note that John Connor weighed in and said that uh, IPv6forum.com does testing. John Connor, did you know that actually, according to the uh, the whole Terminator mythology, I think it was the the night of the nineteenth was when Skynet was supposed to become sentient or something and and nuke all of us. I just it was John Connor, so I <laughs> I, did, I did not know that little bit of trivia. Thank you, Cricket. All right, and so uh, one question came in from uh, Eric Robeson, who says, is it more important to deploy DNSSEC or IPv6 first? Uh, given resources, they're going to have to choose one to start with. That's an interesting question. I'm going to say hands down IPv6, because uh, D DNSSEC, while it's a nice security measure and you know, will enhance the security of domain name services. I don't really see any urgency to it unless you're actually, uh, you know, experiencing DNS attacks that you that you need to solve today. Uh, on the other hand, IPv6, there's there's real urgency here. IPv4 is really running out. You're going to start seeing hosts deployed on the internet that have, at best, degraded IPv4 access and. Uh, you're, you're, you're going to be facing increasingly being disconnected from the real internet if you don't have the ability to talk to both the v4 and the v6 internets very, very soon. I, I personally, I think that in a lot of larger organizations, it wouldn't be the same group doing the implementations anyway. Um, you know, in a smaller organization, it might well be the same people responsible for configuration of the routers as well as configuration of the name servers. In most of the larger enterprises we work with, it's, it's different teams. Uh, you know, maybe in, in the case of, of this particular uh, question, it's just one organization. If you're doing a lot of commerce, if you're doing a lot of sensitive transactions over the Internet, I think it is really important to sign external facing zones. But it's also not that big a deal. You know, uh, you know putting in the necessary infrastructure to do it is not... Uh, as complicated as I think some people make make it out to be. That is, I, you know, unless you're going to roll your own processes from scratch, you know, uh, from the unit command line up. I think that there are a lot of products you could look at to do that that would make it easier. So should we take one or two more and then uh, and then call it a day? Okay. Uh, Chris, our, our uh, uh, man of many questions, asks, can you talk about the different IP address types in v6? I saw a really good um, couple of, of slides or, or, or uh, tables from RIPE that actually had all of the various IPv6 address types called out in them. Yeah, well, I, I actually spend about six slides on that, maybe a little more, in my half-day intro talk that, uh, that I normally give. And uh, it's it's there there are a lot of address types and it's uh, it's quite a complex structure. Those slides were actually originally part of this uh, particular presentation, except we, uh, we we just didn't have the time to squeeze all of that in. And I think that uh, I I would have a hard time doing the question justice in in the remaining time we have. Uh, so if you'll send me an email offline, I will happily send you the slides for that half day intro. And you can actually look those over and, and email me any questions you have. Yeah, and I think that I mean those those materials from Ripe, which are available free for for download. Those certainly I thought were were a very clear uh, explanation of you know both what the function of a particular um, you know, particular IPv6 network was, and sort of whether there was an IPv4 analog to it, and if so, what that was. So, you know, there was the equivalent to 2001 colon DB8, which was, I think, uh, maybe 192.0.2 slash 24, or something like that. So you could pretty easily, if you'd worked with IPv4 for a long time, understand, uh, you know, what related to what. Um, let's see. And I think we'll do what is Oh, absolutely. Yeah, let's take what is prefix delegation. Okay, I'll take what is prefix delegation for 100, Alex. Um, <laughs> okay, DHCP PD or DHCP prefix delegation is a new feature in IPv6 that actually allows you to 
uh, instead of delegating a subnet to a or, or a, a host address to a particular host, allows you to actually delegate an entire prefix, which may contain multiple subnets to a router, which can then subdivide that and further delegate it either as prefixes and or as host addresses to the, to the individual hosts. So it's a way that actually allows v6 to eventually uh, with software yet to be developed, unfortunately, uh, automatically construct entire hierarchies of networks based on a uh, an address provided from theoretically your service provider or some upstream router. Um, for example, a home gateway could receive a slash 48 from Comcast, and it could then divide that up into 56s or 64s or whatever for the various other uh, gateways within the house, and you could actually have an entire topological hierarchy with different security boundaries and, and other capabilities inside the home entirely automatic and plug and play without user intervention. And I know the latest versions of the ISC DHCP server support prefix delegation. Uh, we actually uh, uh, support that in the latest versions of, uh, of our product in InfoBlox. Um, Tim had asked, uh, how is this going to affect the domain name registry industry? The nice thing is that the domain name registry industry is sort of largely orthogonal to you know, the whole question of IPv6. I mean, the, reg the registries, all the big registries, have had the ability to accept registration of name servers that have IPv6 addresses for some time, and that's really the only place that they touch IPv6. And, of course, their name servers, the common net name servers, in the case of VeriSign, uh, the org name servers for PIR, I mean, they all, they all support IPv6 themselves. That is, they run over IPv6 and have IPv6 addresses. Yeah, I think all the, and I'm not sure I've got the right terms here, so if I get them reversed, I apologize. I think all of the registries are supporting v6 pretty completely in the in the domains and in the glue records as needed. I think some of the registrars are still lagging, and so if you're uh, uh, subscribing to a, a registrar for domain name uh, services to, to get your domain posted into the various zone files by the registries, make sure your registrar is v6 ready or start considering switching registrars to, uh, to, to get your stuff where you need it to be. I actually had to do that not too long ago because after I after I set up that that HE tunnel to my house and you know consequently had a, a v6 address for my, my server at home, I found that I couldn't register it through my registrar. So I walked and I went to a different registrar. So you have to be prepared to vote with your feet. Uh, I think that's true uh, both in the case of IPv6 registrations and in the case of DNSSEC being able to, you know, upload a DS record through your registrar to the registry. All right. Well, I think we've uh, we've we've answered a lot of questions here today. We've gone over, and we certainly thank everybody who's uh, who's who's stuck with us until uh, the, the the bitter end here. Um, but again, thank you all very much uh, for tuning in. The slides will be available, right? Owen has them on uh, his, his uh, website. And I uh, hope you'll tune in to our next webcast. Bye-bye. Thanks, Thanks, everybody. And uh, apologies to the people whose questions we didn't get to. Hey, hey uh, Owen and Cricket, I just want to say thank you, too. What a great uh, presentation. And I. Um, no more than about IPv6 than I thought humanly possible. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, and I, I also want to thank our audience. We've had a great crowd here today, and uh, that always leads to wonderful discussion, and I really appreciate it. Oh, don't be scared. Um, I hope that we can have Owen and Cricket back for the near future, so I'm going to talk to them about that some more. But uh, in the meantime, we have the slides available. We have other resources for you guys. And we'll get the uh, recording out to you shortly. So thank you, everyone. I hope we'll see you again soon. Bye-bye.